Oh boy, hello, hello, hello. Uh, my name is Ben Greenfield. Uh, I'm a rabbi out here in Valu in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, the most southern town in the Midwest North, or maybe the most northern town in the Midwest South. We're still working on it. We're still working on it. Um, I am going to share with you, I think was just like one of the most sparkly mind-blowing, beautiful uh, midrashim that ever came to be. Um, and I want to pop it in, I want to pop a link into the actual text so you can see it with your own eyes if you'd like, but I'll also be reading it. And, uh, you know, oral traditions are, they're... let's see if I can get you a link to the actual thing. One momento. Um, bam, share, share, share. Okay, there we are. Cool, that's a link down there. Okay, so this is just a gem. This is a gem. So uh, this week's Parsha B'Shalach, and we have the Song of the Sea. Um, it is Shabbos Shira, the Shabbos of the Great Song. Um, and one of the lines in the song is, Ze'eliv anvehu. Uh, different ways to translate anvehu, but I'm just going to go with, this is my God and I will glorify him. One of the interesting things in this verse is that it's first person. So like we imagine, you know, like the Jewish people as a community all singing. Uh, but this line is first person. And uh, that's just interesting, noteworthy. Um, but what's going to interest this Midrash, what's going to interest this Midrash is like, who's singing? Who's singing? And per perhaps the first person that is what like triggers that question for them. Um, so yeah, who is it that's saying, this is my God, and I will glorify him? And I'm going to return to that this piece, the Zeh, because like the Chachamim, the sages, love Zeh moments in the Torah. We'll get to that at the end. Um, so, Rabbi Huda Omer, Rabbi Huda asked, Mi Amar Kilus La Kodesh Baruch Hu. Who is it that was singing God's praises? Who is, who is singing the Holy One, Blessed Be's praises? Now get ready for this. Hatino Kot, the babies. Hatino Kot. Those very babies that Pharaoh had wished to cast into the Nile River. Because they were the ones who would recognize the Holy One. Now, I like to say sometimes that if I, uh, when I'm teaching Midrash, I wish I always had like a little red button I could press. And it would make a, it would play a dun 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 sound. Because this is a dun 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 moment. Ryuta asked, who at the sea, who at the sea was saying, oh, that's my God? It was the babies, the babies that Pharaoh had uh, wished to, to cast into the Nile. So firstly, that's like, just like a super dark image, the babies that Pharaoh had wished to cast into the Nile. But then also like to think like they were the ones, the babies that Pharaoh wanted to drown in the Nile. They're the ones who are praising God. So already this Midrash is like a total dun 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 Midrash. And for those just popping in, um, your Buddha asked, who said the line, this is my God and I will glorify him, which is in this Parsha at the Song of the Sea. Who said that? And your Buddha's answer is mind-blowing. He says, ah, it was those babies whom Pharaoh had sought to cast into Nile. They were the ones who knew God. They were the ones who recognized God. They were the one who could say, hey, that's my God and I will glorify him. He continues. Ketzad, how was it? Keshahayu Yisrael b'Mitzrayim, back when Israel was in Egypt, and a woman amongst the daughters of Israel, was going to give birth, was about to give birth. She would go out to the field and she would be delivered there. Out in the field, she would give birth. And as soon as the child was born, she would leave it there. And she would entrust her babe to God, to the Blessed One, saying, Ribona Olam, Master of the Universe, Ania Siti et Shali, I did my part, Vata Ase et Shalach, now do yours. But firstly, just like this image of the poor women of the Jewish people who knew that their babes were going to be condemned to drowning in the Nile, what'd they do? They went out to the fields and they secretly gave birth there, and then they picked up their child. Maybe gave it a kiss, put it down and said, I can't take you home. I can't take you home, but I've done my part. I've held this child for nine months. Now, God, you do yours. 
Now, one question I just like love thinking in the midrashic mind here, like what is the tone that the women are taking when they ask this? Like, is this a, is this a prayer? You know, I've done my part. Now you do yours, please. Is this said like, hopefully, like optimistically, I've done mine. Now you do yours. Is this said like with grief? Is this a cry of mourning? Is this said like with anger? Um, you know, like yelling at God, I've done my part now for God's sake, you do yours. Um, so it's just such a moving image, such a moving image that they leave their children out there for God to do his part. And they go back home not knowing what will become of their children. So the Midrash continues. What does become of their children? Amr Biochanan, Rabbi Yochanan said, and I want to just switch just to the English. Immediately, God descended in divine glory. Kivyachol, as if it could say, as if we could say that God really descended. God descended and cut their navel and washed and bathed them. Then God placed two stones in the child's hand, one to suckle oil from and one to suckle honey from. God was nursing them. And so did these young children grow up in the fields. So God did come down and God took these babies and cut their navel, and washed and bathed them. And as soon as they grew up, back in the Midrash, and as soon as they grew up, they would return to their homes, to their parents. And you can imagine that moment, right? When years later, four years later, seven years later, whatever it is, this, somebody knocks on the door and they open the door and it's in seven years later and it's their child, it's their son, he's grown up. And as soon as they grew up, they would return to their homes, to their parents. And when their parents asked them, but who looked after you? They replied, well, there was a lovely, handsome young man who came down and took care of all of our needs. Pause there for a second. That's the story. That's the story. The Jewish woman would go out, and they'd give birth to their kids out in the fields, and God would descend, and God would play nurse, and God would raise these kids, and then they came back. And when the Israelites came to the sea, their children were with them. These same children born in the fields were with them. And when those children saw the Holy One at the splitting of the sea, when they were present there at the revelation of God at the splitting of the sea, they said to their parents, Ze'eli, that's the one. That's him. I was telling you about him. This is the one who did all those things for us when we were in Egypt. Remember that guy I told you about? There he is. And so it says, Ze'eli van Vehu. This is my God, and I will glorify him. Oh, it's so beautiful. It's so, so beautiful on so many levels. Uh, okay, one moment. I had some notes here, and I want to make sure I don't lose them. Goodness. Oh, don't go into that screen. That's silly. Okay, well, there they are. Um, so I've got so many things to say about this. Uh, I think it's just mind-blowing. Um, so firstly, as just like a midrashic aside, Midrashim love the word zeh. They love the word zeh, this. Almost any time you get a zeh in the Torah, a this in the Torah, there's going to be some Midrash that wants to imagine a visual, wants to imagine somebody pointing, literally pointing, and saying zeh, this. So last week's Parsha, uh, we had the first mitzvah given to the Jewish people, hachodesh hazeh lachem. Uh, this month will be for you the first of the months. So there's nothing visual there. That's God telling Moshe to tell Jewish people, like, this upcoming month, Nisan, this is going to be your first month. But there's a Midrash there that's like, Moshe could not figure out how to tell when the new month started. He could not figure out the moons and how this works. So, like, God, like, took the divine finger and was like, Moshe, you see this picture of the moon? Do I have to draw it out for you? And God made a little image, like, that. That's what a new month looks like. And there's plenty of examples like this. Uh, so there's a Zeh in regard to the menorah. And uh, there are Midrashim there that, that also have to imagine, like, okay, God was like, this is what I want. Make it like this. So anyway, just as an aside, anytime you see a Zed, like here, where the Chavim are going to try to imagine, like, who is pointing? Who is recognizing some visual? And the visual here is obviously this image of this, this young man who apparently saved them back in the day in Egypt who suddenly appears again. Okay, so that's number one. First off, this is just like such a phenomenal conception of God that we have in this Midrash. And if you're coming now, uh, there's a link to it on the side there. I'm not going to go over it orally, but you can read it. What a phenomenal conception of God. We have God, the divine nurse. God, the, 
the divine swaddler. He's the wrapper of babes, the wrapper of babes. Uh, it's, I think, a image of God that we want to, be, to believe is true, that we want this to be the God of the Jewish people, that God is the, that miracle which takes a newborn child and brings it somehow into youth and then into adulthood, that, that caring, compassionate, maternal life force um, is the image of God that's presented in this Midrash. I think that's like a very powerful and definitely accessible um, image of God. But I'll return to it because there's, there's a really interesting gender piece that's going on here. And I, I don't know what to make of it. Perhaps you know what to make of it. Uh, I hope there's like a comments thing that you can add because that'd be cool. So I, the gender piece. So this image of God starts so feminine. It starts so feminine. Um, this is God as, you know, taking care of the baby. And it's, it's feminine in the sense of the mom leaves, right? There's no father in the field. The mom leaves and turns to God and says, now you be the mom, you be the mom. And that's what, what God mom does. God uh, cuts the navel and wraps the child and cleans the child. And even the, those two rocks, which are you know, obvious stand-ins, stand-ins for breasts, um, are, are, God is nursing, God is nursing. So it's a clearly feminine image. But then only a few lines later, do we actually find out that this experience of God, this image was actually a male image, that it was a bachur, it was a young man, a handsome man. The baby, the kids report that it was a guy doing all this. And this is amazing because it, it changes uh, the imagery and our take on the rocks. It changes our, our, our sense of the rocks. I first saw the rocks as like a perfectly, like a, a, clear, uh, a clear breast stand-in. And now they're not a stand-in. They are like a sad replacement, right? They're rocks because this is a dude. They're rocks because he can, he can provide a bottle, but he can't provide a, a nipple, uh, can't provide a breast. So it, it really changes it. And I think it actually highlights to some extent how this Midrash is, you know, pl- playing with gender here in the way of um, this male god is, is I think, actually going past what you would expect. So this is, you know, a bachur. This is a 19-year-old boy, a 19-year-old young man. And he's playing nurse. He is the nurse. And maybe that is uncomfortable for him. And maybe it highlights for him how he actually can't do this job perfectly well. And he's going to have to pick up the rocks instead. He's going to have to pick up the sort of bottle instead. But um, this is not God as the young woman or, or God as the mama or God as the grandma. This is God as the young man playing the role of mama or playing the role of grandmother. And that's, I think, just fascinating. And I, I think it will be really important uh, in a few moments when we return back to the sea. Um, so, okay, it's just so beautiful. It's so beautiful. So I want to begin to wrap up um, by saying what I think this Midrash is responding to in this story, meaning this is such an imaginative and colorful way of filling in the Exodus story, where we get all this new detail of their work during the time of the oppression and the infanticide when babies were thrown into the Nile, um, there were pregnant women and they, you know, they had, to, what were they going to do? So they would go out into the countryside and secretly give birth to kids. And then there's this tender, tragic, grief-filled moment when they turn to God and say, I've done my part, now you take him. And they, they leave not knowing what will happen to their child, presuming that the child has died. So there's so much being filled in here, so much being filled in there. Um, so what's the Midrash responding to? What's, what's the context in the Torah that's making the Midrash think like this is a legible and meaningful uh, version of fan fiction uh, or, or Midrash, right? So one thing this Midrash is responding to is that we never hear what happens to Jewish babies during the time of the infanticide. We have some psukim that say, Paro says, okay, throw the babies into Nile. There's no pasuk that says, there's no pasuk that says, and I hope I could, somebody maybe want, we should, should check and prove me wrong, but I believe there's no pasuk that says, no pasuk that says, and then Pharaoh went around picking up babies and throwing them into the Nile. There's no pasuk that says, and so it was, there were 10,000 babies who were killed. We just get the order, and then we get the image of one baby in the Nile, but actually the one baby that specifically is saved, the one baby Moses um, that doesn't drown in the Nile. So to some extent, this Midrash is responding to like, wait, why didn't you tell us what happened? Like, what actually happened? Um, and as an aside here, there's actually a whole family of Midrash team that are responding to this question. So we have, um, I think, the relatively well-known Midrash of Miriam turning to her father and mother, to, to Yocheved and to Amram, and saying, 
guys, like you got to have kids already. And that's responding to this because the, the, the story there is, uh, to take a step back, there's this majoragic idea that in response to Pharaoh's edict, in response to Pharaoh's edict, people just stopped having kids. Like, which is actually pretty reasonable, right? If you knew your baby was gonna be captured by the state and thrown and drowned, you also would probably not have kids if you could help it. Um, so there's this Mishrashic idea responding to that, and then Miriam comes in and says, oh, no, no, you should have kids, you have to have faith, you should believe, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this Midrash here is in the same family, just wondering, like, what happened? Why aren't you telling us about the babies? So one response is, there weren't any babies. And this response is, oh, there were babies. There were babies. They were all out in the fields, away from the Egyptians, born in private. Um, but there's, I think, something deeper about the fact that the Torah doesn't tell us about those babies that this Midrash is responding to, and specifically here at this triumphant moment. Okay, it goes like this. The Song of the Sea sure sounds nice, and it sure seems celebratory. Yay, the Jews won, we did it, we're free, and, you know, cue uh, Prince of Egypt. There can be miracles when you believe. Um, except it's not. Uh, except if you were a mother and you were in slavery in Egypt, who knows how many of your children are drowned. So this is not the image of, you know, the triumphant army, yay, we did it. Uh, to use it, just a harsh image, like this is the image of like Holocaust survivors. Like, yeah, we survived, but I'm like, I'm a survivor. That that sucks. And it, this is the image, maybe even of after uh, after the Independence War. And like, yeah, we won. We have a state. But like, I still have a tattoo in my arm, and my brother was still killed by the Germans, and my town and my whole Jewish history is destroyed. So, you know, we read the Torah and we sort of forget that, or we we put that out of our mind. And this Midrash, I think, is trying to respond to that. Like, how could it be that the Jews were really so triumphant, so singing, so proud? Oh, God's amazing. When, like, a year ago or two years ago, whatever it was, they were slaves and their kids were drowned. And the legacy and the scar and the grief and the mourning is still there. So I think this Midrash tries to fill that in to say, like, it, it just, it, there must have been another miracle. There must have been another miracle. We can't forget those babies. Like, they must have somehow survived. And I think the third and most important thing that this Midrash is responding to, and there's a whole family of these Midrashim that are awesome. Um, this is one of the places, the Song of the Sea and, and specifically the drowning of the Egyptians is perhaps in the five books of the Torah, the peak moment of God as God of violence. Uh, there are plenty of mo moments in the Torah, certainly in Tanakh of God as God of violence and God of just violence, of course. Um, but this is the peak. Uh, we have the image, you know, it's so set up. It's so intentional. There's such a trap. We have God um, luring Pharaoh and his, and his soldiers out to chase the Jewish people. You know, just God, let them be. Let, let the Egyptians just lose. You know, be, be a, don't be a sore winner, God, you know, but God brings the Egyptians out to chase out the Jewish people, draws them out intentionally, then opens up the sea and creates this path which the Egyptians see, no pun intended, which the Egyptians see uh, the Jews cross safely. The Egyptians charge in, and it's, it's this terrible trap, right, with the wall of water here and the wall of water here and all these human lives here, and then and the water returns and the water falls and drowns the whole people, and their bodies wash up on the shore. And, you know, you don't need me to say that this is like peak... Um, God that gives us jitters, right? The Gemara says this. There's like, you know, the off-sided um, image of the angels turn, the angels, uh, I believe, uh, I believe singing. The angels uh, also wanting to join the Jewish people in song at this moment. And God turns to them, God turns to the angels uh, and says, how can you be singing when my creations, the Egyptians are drowning or dying? Um, so, of course, <laughs> God could, you know, ask this question himself. So God isn't singing, but God made the Egyptians drown. Uh, and the Jewish people are singing. So the, the Talmud, the Chazal, are very like aware. If you had to choose one moment when maybe God would be self-conscious of God's actions and God turns to, you know, an embodiment of God's self, to the angels, to the divine red newts, to this part of the divine being, it says, oh, wait, wait, why are we celebrating? This isn't that great. Um, it would be here. So this is this image. Shir Hayam would be the time when you would think of God as God of war. And in fact, we have it in the song, uh, Adonai Ishmael Chama. Adonai Shemo, God is a God of, of war. God is a man of war, excuse me. God is a man of war. Um, 
So it's here, like specifically here, perhaps at peak discomfort, or maybe not discomfort, perhaps at the moment when you might be most invested in and most aware of God as God of just war, which by the way, in human form would be God as Bahur, as young man, strong, young soldier, right? You turn 18, you go into the army. Um, when you're most aware of God as Bahur and most aware of God as soldier and just warrior and slaughterer, that's the moment when this Midrash wants to turn your conception on its head. And the main cameo in this Midrash, of course, is that very Bachur, is that very young man. And that very young man is playing a very different role. And it's not a young woman, it's the Bachur of war. That Bachur comes down and that Bachur picks up these young children and swaddles them and cleans them and bathes them and essentially nurses them to the best of his ability. Um, little do we know what we're gonna see from that Bachur later. And so when those babies, now, now boys, now girls, are there at the Song of the Sea, and there's this revelation of God, and the people are experiencing the God of war, and they're saying, Adonai Ish Milchama, it's those babies, it's those former babies, those kids who are pointing to God and saying, oh my God, I've, I, no pun intended, oh my God, I've seen him before. This warrior, this slaughterer, this you know, God of just violence, I've seen him before. That was the God that swaddled me. That was the God that cleaned me. That was the God that was my, that was my mama. Um, and it's at that moment that they turn to their parents and say, I've seen him before. And I know he can be different. I know it can be someone else. I know that there is a, a lot of sides to this Bahur, to this God. Um, so that's this Midrash. Uh, it's so intense in invoking uh, the babies that Pharaoh wished to or attempted to throw into denial. It's so moving in this expression of maternal uh, hope and really grief of, for God's sake, I did my part, uh, the Holy One. Now it's time for you to do, your, to do yours. It's so touching um, in this image of God as, as God of, as the divine swaddler, as I said. And it's so um, disruptive, intentionally disruptive and intentionally um, imaginative to flip our expectations on our head on the head and at this moment of God as divine uh, warrior and God as just the source of just violence um, it turns and reminds us that yes that's God right now but that's not the only way that God can be okay I hope you enjoyed this was a very very sparkly gem of a midrash bye Let's see if we can make this work Click here, and let me click there. Ah, now you get to see me figure out how to open and close tabs on my computer. Okay, uh, well, I'll just stay on here. I'm gonna stay on here. Maybe we'll schmooze if there's any, what to schmooze about, but at least give that an opportunity. Um, I think Brian Pepper says, hey, Brian. Oh my gosh, I hope we'll see you this Shabbos. I hope we'll see you this Shabbos. We've got the, uh, that, great, that great lunch and learn. Uh, looking forward to, I know it's a schlep from Columbia, but we're looking forward to that. Um, yeah, it's totally interesting that God is, as you said, both masculine and feminine. I would argue that God is male the whole time, male the whole time, but uh, engaged in, in what you know, we, I would associate, for better or worse, I would associate with feminine activity. I think that's actually a lot of the tension in the text, right? That the, God, the male God of war ends up being the one uh, that if you remember, as long as you remember your youth, remember your infancy, you'll remember that he's actually engaged in a whole lot of feminine, maternal, compassionate action. Uh, yeah. Thoughts, reflections, theories out there uh, from Mikey or from Yael. Just like reactions, things that you like, things that you're surprised by, translations you would change. Comments on my bookshelf or on the urn. It's a great urn. It's a great urn. Killer urn. Okay, well, I'm going to hang out here for another minute or so. Uh, if, uh, if Herr Professor Weiss is still, is still here, would love to hear any of his insights uh, on this text or perhaps on related ones. I think it's a, it's a real beaut. Real beaut. Let's see. I don't know. Maybe he's not uh, near a screen, but if Dove Weiss is in the crowd, we've got to ask him what he thinks. Let's see if he'll pop up. And... Yeah, any uh, any comments, questions, jokes? 
Things that surprised you or you loved? Good stuff. I love that message him. Let me give a little message to those boys. Hello. Any comments, insights, associations you could share with us? Of course, uh, the voice of many things, but also a uh, scholar of Midrash. Oh, new comments! Can you show us a favorite book? <laughs> yeah, sure, Eric. Yeah. Um, we got a whole Oh my gosh. Okay, this is a new. This is a new edition. This is a gift from a con a gift, a loan from a congregant, uh, from Harvey Eichen. This is this is just so cool that this exists. Uh, the Book of Memories, Zephyr Zikaron, a history of St. Louis Jewish institutions. Now, as like a academic history or just like a history itself, it would be like interesting, not like amazing. Okay, it's amazing because first off, the woodcuts, the woodcuts, and there's many more, but also. Um, like, this is not written as, like, an objective attempt. This is, like, a guy who took it upon himself to make some, like, really intense comments about the St. Louis Jewish community. Uh, of course, uh, one column is in Yiddish and one column is in English. Uh, but let me just find you, like, a nice example. Um, oh, my gosh. Oh, you know what? Okay, I'm just thinking, I, I'll see if I can find the page. I'll just tell you. He talks about... This is crazy if you just like forget what it's like to be a Jew in America or just in the world before the 21st century. He talks about how um, for a long time the Jewish community didn't have their own funeral wagon, their own like cemetery wagon to bring dead bodies, to bring corpses to the cemetery. They had a Jewish cemetery but didn't have their own wagon. So they would like share a wagon with the non-Jewish cemeteries. And this was just like not it's not dignified not that they should you know they're their own community they should have their own proper wagon so there was this big fundraiser and they finally uh they finally raised enough money and they bought a wagon and then they held a party they had a celebration and i need to find it but there was like yiddish it was like it was like chag ha wagon or like the the wagoner yentiv something like that the wagoner yentiv and they all celebrated they were so proud this is just like full of gems and you get um you get nice little pictures also um let me show you a nice little picture of the like old original here's a show of and i don't believe this exists anymore i mean certainly they're not in this building anymore but this is in like downtown st louis these are all in downtown st louis um so totally awesome totally awesome oh little hasidic wait is this about the first hasidic show no but yeah so this is awesome that's one i'd say that's one new favorite book one new favorite book. Okay. Uh, okay, wait. I'm going to quote from Yael, who wrote me something. She said, This reminds me of the Midrash of Hashem taking care of the child in the Midrash that we quote in the Haggadah. Can you help me out with that? I'm not sure what Yael's re referring to. The Alkapapin or somebody else, the Midrash in the Haggadah where we talk about God taking care of a child, not coming to my mind immediately. Any of y'all? Otherwise, I'm going to have to give you more book tour. Way more book tour. Way more book tour. Okay, what's one that's, I mean, there's a lot of grades here, but what's one that's as fun as that? Oh, there's so many ones that are as fun as that. Okay. Okay, I'm going to give you a tour. I really don't like the fact that most bookshelves are like a way of humble bragging. Um, really don't like that. Um, so I'm going to give you a tour of the books that I haven't read. I'm just going to give you a couple that I haven't read, uh, show you aspirations. But like, yeah, I mean, I, didn't, I bought it before I knew I actually had time. So there I was. Okay, so a couple winners, a couple winners over here. Tell me if you if you have read. Let me know. So this looks like one, right? Eros and the Jews. Cool, right? Wouldn't you do the one-click buy on Amazon for that? This guy did. Okay, that's a winner. Um, this was a gift from a congregant, and I read half of it, and it's actually really good. Hitler in Los Angeles. 
So before World War II, there was like a Nazi party in America, you know, their headquarters was LA. It's actually like a fascinating story. Like lots of like uh, active political Nazis in LA and Hollywood. And there was like one Jewish guy who was like on that to stop that really fast. Okay, cool. But let's a little deeper. Um, oh boy. Wouldn't this be a cool one to have read? Seven Practices of Effective Ministry. If you've read this and you know what the seven practices are, please let me know. I'm trying to make my ministry a little bit more effective. And finally, and then I think it's time for us to sign off. Finally, I think it's time to sign off. Um, okay. Oh, this one I've started. This one I've started. If you've actually read it and can recommend particular parts, that would help me. Facing the Abusing God, A Theology of Protest. Facing the Abusing God, and maybe uh, to some extent, our Midrash is in that category. Whole book just on that topic. I have not read it. Will I ever read it? Who knows? Hopefully. Um, okay. This has been fun. Um, there are so many beautiful Midrashim on this week's Parsha, so many beautiful Midrashim uh, buried in our books of Midrash. It is a absolute shame that there are so many gorgeous ones that are sort of living in the graveyards of the Torah of Israel. And uh, all of us have an opportunity to like just go and open like a random book of Midrash, particularly the Hebrew is good. There's also the sun scene out there, but it's hard. Um, and discover them because they're just like literally waiting to be discovered. There's always gems that are not well-known Torah, not popular Torah, not things that people are talking about that are just like in the random 37th Parsha of Shemar Rabbah. Uh, and they're there and everybody should know them in the sense that third grade Rebbe should be teaching them. Um, and you can rescue them. You can rescue them. God did his part. God did his part. Gave us his midrashim. Uh, now it's our time to do ours and take them and resuscitate them and let everyone know about these beautiful, beautiful pieces of Torah out there.